our next session is one of the things that I'm very excited about. One of the best ways for us to learn is by watching other people learn. And this is through the Art of Clarinet Master Classes, which is basically where we have somebody having a lesson with a great teacher and the teacher gives that person the solution. They try it, it works. But for us, we all have the same common clarinet problems. So what we've got here are some uh, three volunteers who are volunteering to play for us at different levels of playing, some less experienced, some more experienced. And early at our session, Debbie introduced our wonderful um, ICA executives. We have Denise Ganey, who's the president of the International Clarinet Association, Diane Barger, who's the president-elect. Together, they are the Amicitia duet, which is an amazing, I hope I said that right, <laughs> duet. They're wonderful teachers. I don't think I did. They'll, they'll correct me. And they are going to be our clinicians. Um, I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for this. I'm going to just be the tech person, but um, Kevin, we have you up first. So if you want to unmute yourself, I've asked our participants to record a short piece and I'm going to put their music and recording on screen for everybody to see. And uh, after that point, um, we'll have our clinicians work with our guest artists. So Kevin, do you want to just give a quick introduction to what you're working on with this piece of music? Uh, yeah, um, I've been doing uh, Leon Lester pieces and working my way through. It's sort of a beginner intermediate or something book. And so um, I uh, am up to number 12. <laughs> and so um, as I go through, it's, it's kind of a general everything. I think uh, one of the things I need work on is uh, intervals. Maybe I need more exercises doing where I'm moving more fingers instead of doing like scales where I'm jumping, having to go up more notes. And then right. just generally overall. Great, thanks Kevin. I'm gonna play your video. And you've been playing about two years just to give everyone context here, right? Yeah, I, my, we started kind of with uh, with you online. Yeah, I first picked it up just after COVID started. Okay, great, here we go. And did some stuff online and then, um, and then uh, Starting getting online lessons, uh, yeah, like a year or so ago, a year and a half ago. No sound. No sound. Uh, Michelle, we <laughs> No sound. Might need to close the share and There's then select no the share sound button.
Okay, well, um, bravo, Kevin. <laughs> First of all, I cannot believe you've only been playing two years. For real? Oh, my gosh. That is, you know, so awesome. So bravo <laughs> to you for the already the wonderful work that you're already doing. I mean, it's really stupendous. So congratulations. Um, and I, I think working on etudes are are really wonderful. And the the thing that I there are a couple things that I'd like to talk to you about briefly before I, I um, hand the baton over to Denise um, is, uh, first of all, has anybody ever worked with you on resonance fingerings for your throat tone notes? Um, not really. I think maybe I've been I barely know what you're talking about. But yeah, it's where I put down an extra <laughs> finger, right? Right, right. For, you know, G, G sharp, A, B flat, you know, the most ugly notes on the clarinet, right? Our yep. throat tone fingering. So, yeah. Um, so that would be something, you know, just a real quick, quick guideline. Now, you're going to feel like you're relearning the clarinet on some of these notes, but I guarantee you that you're going to be able to get more clarity, more homogeneity going over the break. It'll just be easier um, and the sound will be more rounded, um, more resonant, hence the, no, the, the name resonance fingerings, um, <laughs> and intonation will improve too. So just okay. a real crash course, you know, for, for our open G, basically one and three in the right hand is thought to be the best fingering. Uh, G sharp, three one. Okay, A natural, two three two three C key is often what people choose to do. Now, granted, you need to check, you know, your instrument, you know, with the tuner to see which is going to be the best. But that's traditionally one of the best ones. B flat. This is where we tend to get a couple different uh, fingerings. If you're going from A to B flat, and as you're just starting to learn these notes, if you want to use two three two three C key for the B flat, that's okay. It's a little bit more muffled, so some people choose to do three three C key. Okay. okay. So, um, and then I have I have some other fingerings that I use also, but those are the general fingerings. Uh, there's a really good book by Tom Ridenour called Clarinet Fingerings and. He has all of those fingerings available, and that's a really great book. Plus, he's got all, all you know, 19 high G fingerings, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a terrific book to own. My other suggestion to you, and quite frankly, anybody listening, and I wanted to share this. Um, uh, okay, it only says one participant can share it at a time. Uh, hang on, let me, okay, now I got it. Here we go. Um, this I stole from a former student of mine, um, Dr. Elizabeth Alexander, who teaches at University of uh, Tennessee at Martin. And this is called the Musical Mood Wheel. Can you all, hopefully you guys can see it. Okay, and basically a psychologist came up with um, a mood wheel um, to work with his patients. And basically there are seven, eight different moods and that you can see in the middle of the page here, you've got sad, disgusted, angry, fearful, bad, surprised, happy. And then you break out into other adjectives. Okay. And I, and then I added to this and I color coordinated it. Um, so there's more adjectives for happy, more for bad, et cetera, et cetera. And what I think is really fun for you to maybe incorporate into your playing, Kevin, is mm -hmm. like take a phrase of the Lester and ask yourself, okay, what kind of mood, what kind of character do I want to play in? And the way, um, and then try something else, you know, and the way you play when you're angry is different from the way that you're going to play when you're blissful. OK, and even the way you breathe will be affected by incorporating some of these characters. And, you know, I always like to encourage my students tell a story, you know, and make up a story of what's happening in your music. And I think etudes are a wonderful way to experience this. And then when we go and play our solo repertoire, we we have that knowledge of okay yeah. i have to make so many decisions because there's not a lot of information generally in etudes right 
you didn't have that much in that Lester. Um, so those are those are my little tips, uh, and I know I'm probably speaking way too long, so I'm going to let Denise take over. No, <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you for talking about the resonance fingerings. That's fantastic. If you don't, if you can't get that wonderful book right now that, that Diane mentioned, I have a, just a basic handout with those. Feel free to email me. I would be happy to share with anybody. So just let me know. Um, okay. Al, I wanted to tell you that you um, have done a great job by hooking up with Michelle Anderson because she has done a huge service to especially the enthusiast com community and we are so grateful to have her involved with the ICA so keep doing everything she tells you right so that's a <laughs> thing um, and I did want to reiterate that what a beautiful sound for just two years that's really amazing so a lot of maturity in the sound so that's fantastic so um, since Diane covered a couple of those other issues I'm going to talk about a couple of um, physical things that I want you to think about in the time that we have uh, first of all, you have, like I do, long fingers. And so on clarinet, that kind of gives us a problem sometimes. So I want, right now you're playing very flat fingered. So I want you to think okay. about trying to get a little more arch in your knuckle. We have to be careful because we definitely don't want to be tips down. So um, Diane, I learned from her, a, a great way to describe this is that you don't want to be able to see the rings of the clarinet. You should cover those, but you should be able to see the ball. Okay, yeah. Lost sound. Denise, you muted yourself. There you go. Oh, how did I do that? I'll thunk. Oh, thanks. Okay, I'm going to stay away from the computer. <laughs> anyway, I hope you heard some of that. Anyway, um, but trying to think more like your bottom hand looking like a backward C as you look down the instrument and try not to let it arch up. This is something that I did when I was young, you know, a long time ago, and it took a, a lot of work with Cal Opperman to finally start getting it down again. But trying to um, just to make sure we're not up jammed against the trill keys or arched up. And the more you play, the more your hand tends to arch up, which is going to lead to squeaks, right? Because we're going to leak that largest tone hole at the bottom. So oh, trying okay. to think about keeping those fingers, the, the fleshy part of the tone hole, of the finger in the tone hole, but not the tip. So find that place, right? And then keep your, think about guide position. So for your bottom pinky, keep it on the low F, C key. And if we think about our pinkies, I'm gonna keep my top pinky on the E, B key. And these are our anchors that help to keep us in position and help to prevent us from what's called tracking, That which means we all do it sometimes that we play up the scale and our fingers follow. And we wanna to try to keep fingers in position. Think about yeah. economy of motion so that as we are playing, our fingers are ready to go back at that tone hole and we don't have to go find the tone hole. Okay. Number one cause of squeaks on clarinet fingers. We all go to our reads. Uh -uh. Typically, it's because we leaped. I know that's always me when that happens, okay. right? So with your top hand, think about your index finger. This is the one that concerned me the most. It's really kind of out like the bottom hand. I want you to think about making more of a hook with your index finger. So you're going to be kind of wrapped around that A flat A key, right? And so as you're playing, you're doing that instead of that. You see the difference there? So you're going to actually arch up a little bit with that top hand. Okay. And doing that, again, is going to keep your fingers more in position where they need to be. Of course, your thumb at about a 1 o'clock angle in the back. Um, but with this, another thing to think about and that will help the etude that you played on, think about there being a hinge from your first tone hole to the A key. Sometimes you're coming up a little high on the A key, which okay. is going to cause us to... More time to come down. Remember, what goes up must come down. So, so okay. you got to make sure we stay in position. So if you just do some practice, there's a really good video out that Michael Lowenstern has that talks about this very issue. Um, and I'm sure Michelle does too. But if you will kind of look at this, that you're doing that rather than leaping up to the key. So those would just be some basic things to help you to to navigate the instrument. And this takes time to change. So the yeah. mirror is your best friend along with slow practice. And okay. as Diane said, these etudes are fantastic to address so many of the things you're trying to work on right now. And so I would really, really think about slow practice, maybe pick one finger a day to think about. I'm gonna think about curving my index finger and I'm gonna to try to keep it close to the instrument, right? But see if that helps you with, with technique as well. Um, um, as I said, I noticed your bottom hand kind of arching up. So we want to really be careful yep. about staying relaxed and down, right? So relax, 
we all get, I'm the most tense person in the world, so I have to work extra hard at trying to get my body to stay relaxed while I play. But that's something actually that COVID has been good for, being kind of away and from the have to, have to, have to do this and have some time to slow down for once, right? Um, mm -hmm. Michelle, how are we with time? I just want to make sure we... Sorry. I, you know, I, I think even though there's tons of great things you could say, we probably should move yeah. on. Okay. Thank you, thank Kevin. You, that was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank well, you. Wanna, thank you, Kevin. I want to introduce Cynthia, who's volunteered to play for us. Cynthia, if you want to unmute yourself, introduce yourself, I'll put your music and video up for everybody. Hi, I'm, I'm Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. Um, I've been playing five years. I played the first three with my teacher, uh, Laurel Hall, and the last two with Michelle and the clarinet mastery uh, class, and I've enjoyed every bit of it, all of my lessons. This piece is called uh, Bercuse. I chose it because I wanted to play something beautiful. I'm trying to get a clear, um, nicely shaped notes with good dynamics. Nice work, nice work. Diane, do you want me to go first or you want to go first? Okay, <laughs> so really, really lovely playing, Cynthia, and um, I love your sound is developing so beautifully, really nicely. You're, I can tell you're thinking about how you're wanting to shape phrases and everything. Um, so I want you to think about how we can get even more legato, right? How we can really think about connecting the notes with the air. And if you can, if you've got your music there for a moment, could I get you to play the first couple of phrases for us again? Sure. So now a question for you, how did you decide how to shape that phrase? Did you sing through it at all? I was or did singing you... it. Mm -hmm. I was singing. Great. Okay, so that's a wonderful way to help us kind of think about how a phrase would work best. If, especially if you don't have a recording to listen to or something, 
Um, but if you think about singing the phrase and then trying to sing through the clarinet, so we're trying to get the, you know, we're very close to the human voice on clarinet, trying to think about seeing the big picture of the phrase, um, just thinking, you know, where am I going? And then in between there, we want to try, one of my favorite stories came from a colleague of, of Diane's, don't pick too many flowers along the way, right? So <laughs> as, we, as we play that phrase, we want to think big picture instead of this, all right? Um, and so that also, the, the tricky part, is when we have rests involved and so rests okay what happens in the middle it's like the Mozart when you're playing the opening of the Mozart those rests can be really tricky right so thinking how do we keep the 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 phrase going without okay there's a stop and sound but we've got to make it sound like it just goes on with a little bit of a lift so I think the same thing here um, so I would continue practicing that idea of thinking really nice um, connected legato phrases, even if there's a rest there. Some of the things that will help you with that, just real quickly, and then I'll let Diane take over, back to what we talked about with resonance fingerings. A lot of the things that you're doing um, are throwing you out of position. You're letting yourself leap up to the A key and stuff. So if okay. you can think about, again, either using the resonance fingerings, which would be a huge help to help you develop that kind of home base feeling where we always try to keep those pinkies on the close to our guide keys um, so that we're not coming up and then having to come back down. It just causes it to sound choppy. And so this can help you to really get that to be more fluid as you play. It will also help with the intonation a great deal, right? So trying to get less motion in the hands, trying to think more still or close to the instrument so uh, keep reminding yourself economy of motion the less motion the better and it's going to keep us right where we need to be right let me let diane go ahead and take over er, cynthia congratulations so beautiful wonderful playing um so my question to you is is um since this is a transcription right what is this originally for this piece i tried to um i looked it up I've heard it in an opera, so I don't, it was written as just a single piece, apparently. I can't find more information on it. Yeah, yeah, so, so it's basically a, a piece for, for vocalist and piano, right? Yeah, so, so and, that, and that's even more along the line. I mean, Denise was exactly right. I mean, we're wannabe singers, right? We just happen to pick the clarinet <laughs> um, because that's the voice we we uh we love you know so um were you able to hear any of uh, any recordings of yes. the piece okay so i'm i'm just curious um you know because i listened to some as well and this is such a beautiful piece and and um i think for example like in the fourth measure after you come in your poco retard a lot of vocalists actually they do a little bit more than poco um <laughs> do a retard um and they actually breathe on the bar line so and so so i i would just encourage you to try to emulate and match the original versions um uh pace etc you know the phrasing um i couldn't i couldn't locate the text but i'm sure it's textual too which uh is the reason that a lot of vocalists tend to breathe there so all i think you have what four different places in the piece where you've got those uh similar similar lines in the three stanzas yes. so i would just make that change um and again, you know, uh, uh, I think we all can benefit from this is exaggerating dynamics. You know, the, the, the Cynthia Scheinberg that is playing in your head is like the most amazing musician, but I don't think she's always coming through to the audience and we can all, we can all attest to that. Okay. Um, and do you ever record yourself when you play yes, other yes. than what you did for this? Yes. Okay, perfect. Do you notice that sometimes, oh man, I thought I was so much more musical and it doesn't come out, right? Often, yes. yeah. Yeah, right. So so what I tell my students, you know, what, um, I mean, of course, we're trying to listen to ourselves, but I really pay attention to what I'm doing with my wind. If I really feel like my wind is actively going, you know, and doing this big forte, I know it's going to be heard. 
Okay, so in addition to the wonderful listening that you're doing, try to pay attention to what your physical being is is feeling, you know, with the air, and that's going to really help. Okay, the, the, the last thing that I would say is I'm wondering if you could take a little bit more reed in your mouth when you play. Okay. Okay. I, I keep working on that. I think I'm working my way down a little bit at a time. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, you'll know when it's too far, right? Because we'll squeak, right? Um, but, you know, a good kind of general rule, and, and I'm sure Michelle has gone over this with you, but if you look um, at the profile view of your clarinet, you know, uh, against a white piece of paper, you'll be able to see where the reed finally touches the mouthpiece. You basically don't want your lower lip above that spot because if you do it's not getting the maximum vibration that you could possibly achieve okay so and and i'm not saying more from the tip i just think you have to slightly lower your lower lip a little bit down so don't take more mouthpiece this way because that's you know you'll probably go a little bit too far over so just literally draw off and what that does is open up your jaw too yay um and helps us not bite okay great so so a lot of benefits do you want to try that now sure so just you know uh make an embouchure kind of like where you normally play and then that's literally okay now literally just lower that lip a little bit down on the reed Okay. And then just play us a nice little, well, that's okay. Mm -hmm. well, why don't you play a low C? Oh, yeah, I can hear the difference just doing it slightly different. Okay. Yeah, so, so maybe play around with that. And, okay. um, again, that's going to help you. Um, and, and rather than, I like to, like to teach my students, rather than pressing up against the reed with your lower lip, I want you to feel like you're pressing across and down. Okay. And that kind of grip, again, will help you not bite um, and kind of, you know, choke up on the mouthpiece a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense to it you? It does. I'll give okay. that a try. Perfect. Michelle, do we need to move on? I think so. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Beautiful playing. Congratulations. All right. I want to introduce our, our final volunteer today, uh, which is Lori. Lori actually is a member of our ICA Enthusiast Committee and uh, is an arranger, a composer. She's leading some of our breakout rooms and she's offered to play some bass clarinet for us. Wonderful. Today. Okay, I'll just go ahead and play, unless you want to introduce anything here, Lori. I had just maybe to switch the music on the screen. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you for that. Sorry. It won't sound anything like what's up there. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, thank you. <laughs> Nice job. 
Thank you. All right, Diane, you or me? Oh, I'll go first this time and, and we'll save the best for last. So Denise, Denise has a lot better bass clarinet chops than I do. But um, first of all, Lori Brava, that was beautiful. Man, you've got a really facile articulation, don't you? Really nice. And I felt like you got, you know, you were clearer in the second excerpt, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so it was really terrific. Very, very good. Um, you know, the, my, my biggest advice is just, you know, practice a little bit more with the metronome so you don't rush. Um, cause you were just a little bit unsteady to start with. And then I think you kind of found your groove. Mm -hmm. Stella found her groove. Um, so, but, but, you know, especially when we're practicing excerpts, um, of any kind, you know, um, back when I was taking orchestra auditions, you know, I would practice more with a metronome than without. Okay. Um, just because, especially when we're doing, you know, band music, orchestra music, you know, we're expected to play very metronomic, right? So, so that would just be one piece of advice that I would offer. Um, and then when you have the opportunity, like before rehearsal 202 where you have this d t o e t o e t o e t o e um that's not um any kind of staccato but it's more legato to actually make sure that you don't play those eighth notes short but think and think much more of a legato type of articulation um at the beginning of every slur da t o e t o e t o e um my one of my teachers mr marcellus used to say that there basically you have three different articulation speeches for the most legato it's more like saying thee 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 for a non legato non staccato it's saying d d d d and then for more of a staccato it's deet 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 okay so you can everybody uh, who's who's muted? Just say thee 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 d d d d d d, and you can you can hear that that and feel that that's three different kind of articulations. Okay, so here because it's legato, I would encourage you to really make that super uh, super legato with that articulation, so you make that contrast a little bit more. Can you try that for all of us? Yeah. yeah try it again I'm, I'm putting you on the spot you haven't you haven't done anything and it's just you're only going to play the begin you know sorry articulate the beginning of the 16th right so da t o e t o e t o there you go my question in that is that i i did manipulate my music because the other the divisi part actually has the 16th note right in the right spots <laughs> so should i still, got it should i still pardon uh, should i still hang or do the full legato or should i do well something? no matter what i wouldn't do i wouldn't do a staccato so oh. you know you can go da t o e t o e t o e t o e yeah because when the other person combines it should be super legato between okay. the two of you yeah okay yeah, I still hear that you're tonguing da tia ta tia ta tia ta. Try to slur t o e t o e t o e. Okay, so that might be something that you work on, and maybe you could put over your music. You know, on the A, put a t, t for tongue, and then on the B natural, T for tongue, and then you don't tongue again until the D. Okay. And then the next F sharp, the A, the C sharp, the E, the G. You see what I'm saying? I think so. <laughs> yeah, so da, T, O, E, T, O, E. And something that I encourage my students to do is put the clarinet down mm -hmm. and talk through it, you know, because if you can say it, you can play it. All right. So so you could practice without the bass clarinet. Ta ti o a ti o a ti o a ti o a. And once you get that speech of your tongue, then you just talk that out on your read. Does that make okay. sense? Yes. OK, yeah. perfect. Great. I'm going to uh, let Denise take over.
There we go, technology. And my dog's in the room panting, so if you hear a loud noise, she's a big dog, so I'm sorry. It's Marley. I don't, I don't know. Sorry, my husband's asking if she's had her treat yet. <laughs> I've, been in, I've been busy. Um, so beautiful play, and why didn't, why didn't you pick something hard to play? <laughs> That's really tough on me. Play yeah, it. all that technique for tomorrow. So, oh, good for you. Well, good. So, yeah. I want I want to piggyback on something that Diane said about that passage you were just working on. Just a mm -hmm. good rule of thumb that I try to tell my students: the last slurred note is going to be played in the style of the note that follows. So, for example, if you have a slur followed by another slur group, slur group, that's going to be super legato. But if you have a slur followed by a staccato, you're going to clip that last note of the slur. And of course, there are more, you know refinements and stuff you can do to that but that's just a good basic rule of thumb to remember when you're okay. in an ensemble rehearsal um, so think about that so that section wants to be really legato within this something else I'm hearing happening in your technique um, is that you're tending to rush off of the first note of a group we all do it right it's human nature and mm -hmm. so I like to think read I want to read I want to read I want to read or read I want read I want if you have triplets but something it's we're not making that note longer than the others we're actually just making it not be jumped off of so you're giving it its okay. full length so if you go through some of this where you have a dee da dum read I want and kind of stretch that first note mentally it's going to help you keep from compressing the rhythm and cause it to sound a little sloppier right so that'll help to fix that um, other thing on bass clarinet besides just tons of air you sound fantastic especially when you're playing forte try to keep that same fast air engage the cage right keep that mm -hmm. same fast air when you're playing softly because that reed still got to vibrate right it's got to vibrate so you get that nice clear sound we have that big reed big pipe that we've got to deal with so really think about you know keeping that air super fast all the way through mm -hmm. and go back and really think about hand position what can you do it's it's important on B flat always it's mm -hmm. extra important on bass because we have such big key work everything spread right. out so the more you can keep your fingers in position the better and it's even easier on bass because we don't have the open tone holes to deal with so you can get pretty close right mm -hmm. so thinking about that is going to also help with this technique because sometimes you're just pulling your fingers far away from where they need to be and they're having to get back down you're doing a good job with it but you could get it even cleaner and even better if you'll do that so faster air yeah and then think about my own videos. video definitely illuminated some, <laughs> some yeah oh there. no but that's that's you know okay. i think yeah I I should pay attention to that. <laughs> well, you know, never feel badly. When I went to Cal Opperman, I was almost done with my doctoral degree, and he completely changed everything about my hands. And at the time, it was emotionally scarring, but I'm glad he did because it really helped to take my playing to another level compared to where it was before. And so I would say, you know, that's the foundation for everything we do is that hand position, right? That in the air. So making sure we keep things where we need to do and keeping a really good foundation of air is going to help so much. Right. But I think you're playing with really good energy. Um, I think you're really trying to get the style of the music. You've captured that spirit really well. Mm -hmm. So now you can just go in and do some little polishing things that are going to help you get even more clarity in what you're playing. But I think really beautiful job. And thank you for being brave and playing such a tough excerpt on bass for us. Really well done. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> I feel I like. Oh, go ahead. Diane. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, if we're kind of wrapping this up, I just wanted to, first of all, on behalf of Denise and I, we are the Amakitia duo. So that's how to pronounce Amakitia. It's okay. And my name is Diane Barger. Everybody Burr. said her. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping when I got married that people could pronounce my last name because my maiden name was horrific. Um, but that's okay. You can call me anything. So, and I'll respond. But we want to thank you all so much for your yes. beautiful playing, your wonderful preparation, your um your Teacher wonderful spirit. spirits wow. oh my gosh wow did you just say that wow we yeah. said the same thing we're the same um and just like you know michelle has these amazing videos available for everybody if you go to the amakitia duo website we also have some pedagogical videos that are available on our website and we'd love for you guys to check those out so just thank you so much for a wonderful morning of of beautiful playing yeah, how are you yeah. yeah. So thank you. It takes courage to play in front of people. So thank you all for being open to our suggestions and we hope something we said helps. Well done. That's great.
uh, thank you so much both of you this was amazing and thank you to our three volunteers it is nerve-wracking to play in front of a group of clarinetists so uh, we so appreciate it thank you so much um debbie do you mind